So let us go over uh, quiz eight to begin with. Let me make sure my audio is actually working. Yay. Okay, so, um, all right, so you guys are still learning, and that's fine. Um, but there is a test Friday, so, um, yeah. Okay, so A.B is, uh, uh, it's helpful to write the vectors again here. So 1, 2, 0, dotted with 3, minus 1, 4. Okay, so that is 1 times 3, plus 2 times minus 1, plus 0 times 4. And, and that's just the definition of dot product. So you guys got that? Of 1. Yeah, that is, that is 1. So there's... You were supposed to have <coughs> together. Yes. Well, I mean, if you have if you have it with, if you you have it you have it with commas, that's a very popular mistake. Um, but yeah, um, well that that's um, see so you're you're just uh, you're working in. Uh, I mean that has a name. It's actually called the Hadamard product. It's the uh, the direct project pro, direct product algebra of R with itself like three times. But yeah, it is. <laughs> it's, it, but it's not technically the answer this question but but it, I mean it is a very popular wrong answer though um, so a is the square root of um, a dot a by the way we could look at it that way and yeah <laughs> once we, well there yes if you got this wrong um, <clears throat> yeah yeah that that would not be that would not be good Yeah, let's see here. So you've got 9 plus 1 is 10. 10 plus 16 squared of 26. Very good. Yep. Ooh, I got, one. got that one. Um, the angle between A and B. So the key here is to remember that we have a formula for the dot product that relates to the angle between the vectors. A dot B is AB cosine of the angle between them. So that gives us the theta is the inverse cosine of a dot b over a b, which in this kind, you're, you're getting there. Yeah, inverse cosine of 1 um, over the square root of 5 times the square root of 26, which, by the way, is equal to the inverse cosine of 1 over the square root of 5 times 26, which is 130. Now, what is that? Well, I don't know. Yeah, square root of 130. 84.96. 84.96. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, oh, I'm in radian mode. Let me get out of that. I mean, nothing wrong with radian mode. Just And uh, I try not to take off points for you guys unless the, like, I, I allow you to take give answers in radians or degrees unless I've otherwise stated, you know? So that's something I have to watch out for in my grading. You said, what did you say, 84.97? Yeah, there you go. So 84.97 degrees. So these vectors are nearly perpendicular, but they're not perpendicular, right? Because A dot B would have to be 0. But you can see how they're close to 0, right? Because if you look at A times B, you've got the square root of 130, which is around about 11.5 or something. And 11.5 um, versus 1, well, 11.5 is pretty big. 1 is pretty small. This is pretty close to 0 relative to the magnitude, um, relative to the product of their magnitudes, you know? Uh, let's see here. So that's, that's A, B, C. Now D, we're supposed to calculate the cross product of A and B. All right. So here we go. This is the formula for the cross product that I showed in the video that I apparently have not linked to, but it's on the playlist. Yeah. But if you, know, if you ever can't find a video of mine or something like that, you should just email me. I, well, that's OK. But I, I, I mean, I am you know, here to help. Let's see here. So um, all right, so uh, we can either use x hats or i hats. What do you guys want? I'll use the i hat, j hat, k hat, business. Uh, A was what? 1, 2, 0. B was 3 minus 1, 4. So 
So we do i hat times the determinant of 2, 0, minus 1, 4, minus j times the determinant of 1, 3, 0, 4. Now, you don't have to write it this way. You could just use the formula I wrote in class, but um, this is the pattern. And then if we have the determinant of like a, b, c, d, it's a, d minus b, c. Um, so using the determinant notation has the advantage of like, you know, um, introducing you guys to determinants, which is useful in its own regard. That's i times 8, j hat times 4, k hat times minus 1, minus 6. So I much prefer the other notation, which is 8 minus 4 minus 7. Now the question is, are we right? Right? And so that question can only be settled by checking the answer. Checking the answer here is easy because if it's right, we should have, you know, a dot a cross b is what? Should be what? These should both be zero, right? Because a cross b is supposed to be the vector which is perpendicular to both a and b. That's its very the reason for its construction, the reason we're interested in the cross product is, you know, creating a third vector which is perpendicular to the given two. And, um, man, this chalk really does not show up. I'm going to switch to the other one. So um, here we've got what? Um, so I'm not going to write it out. I'm just going to, like, do it. 1 times 8 is 8, right? 2 times minus 4 is minus 8. 0 times 7 is 0. Well, there's 1. It's perpendicular to A. That's good. 3 times 8 is 24. Um, minus 1 times minus 4 is plus 4, right? And minus 4 times 7, minus 28. Right. So. In order to, if we were to get this wrong and have both of these dot products zero, we would be fantastically unlucky. All right, so if you check the dot products of both your, with both of your inputs and they're both zero, odds are very, very good that you've calculated the cross product right or you're merely off by a sign. Like it'd still be true if you had minus this factor, everything we just did. But nobody does that. So there you go, that's the cross product, right? And now, <clears throat> if you haven't seen the video, you wouldn't know this unless you read the notes. But um, so I, I did talk about in class Friday that like the area of parallelogram, right? We have A here and we have B here. This is angle theta, right? And the area of that parallelogram would be AB sine theta, right? So what happens if you take half of it? Well, so that would be, right, so the area is one half the magnitude of a cross b. Which, by the way, this is not something we haven't talked about before. Because remember we had before, if you have a triangle where you have, yeah, where you have the uh, length of one side is, let's say, a, and the length of the other side is b, and theta is the angle between those sides. Remember, we found that the formula was one half a, um, one half AB sine theta, which is exactly what this is. So you, you have choices. You could either, to calculate part E, you could take one half of AB sine theta, which would be kind of based on like earlier stuff we did, right? You've already got the angle from like part C, right? Or I think the easier thing to do um, is to just take one half of the magnitude of the cross product, right? So. This is literally one half the square root of eight squared plus minus four squared plus minus seven squared, whatever that is. Uh, 64 plus. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And then divide by 2. Okay. So there you go. There's the approximate area of that triangle. And as you can see, we didn't have to draw any of the pictures that you were... That you were... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not wrong. It's not wrong. It's just not going to work um, in the time pressure of a test, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm trying to teach you guys not just a possible way of doing things, but like a good way of doing things. And so it's, it's okay. But anyway, now, now you've, you have seen, so these are, um, this is pretty much like the first question I ask in a Calculus 3 class, because we study vectors at the start of it. And so we'll spend about two weeks in Calculus 3 on these things, and a little bit more. I do a little bit more in Calculus 3 than I do with you guys, um, for sure. But um, basically, this is typically my first test question in Calc 3. And um, usually people do what you did. They give me the, the vector. Instead of giving me one, they give me three comma minus two comma zero. Like oh, very, very popular, very popular. And um, it's anybody's guess what students will do for A cross B because they haven't really studied it by the time. The, it's like the first test in calculus. Like there's a lot of students who have a tradition of just not paying attention for the first test, right? Because that's not you guys. But there is this, there's a subset of students who are, this is their custom. <laughs> but anyway, so with that, you guys, any questions you got about the take home quiz or Wednesday? Yeah. It's on everything we've covered since test the last test. So it's I um, there are some theorems like, what? What I can't. Oh, huh. it wasn't the erasing. It was just the, it was the theorem. Well, I mean, there there are theorems like show the dot product is commutative, or show the cross product is a cross b is minus b cross a, or. Yeah, those those are possible. But were they, were, was there a theorem? Was there a theorem on take home quiz five? The last, the last one? Yeah. Yeah. It was like draw, like draw, it was wrong, and then it was like a bunch of. Oh, yeah, quiz, take home quiz five, that's it. The one that I wrote six on. Drum? There's a, there's a drum? Oh, draw. Yeah. It's like draw and tell us what, like, what, if it was a shell or if it was a. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah those, those, but those are not theorems. So I, I, I do intend to give you one of those um, curve sketching problems in the quiz Wednesday uh, because I think you need more practice on it for sure. And my hope, my intention for the Wednesday, Wednesday one is to actually give you a paper which has both a place to draw the, you know, the graph of the, the polar R versus theta and then an XY right under it so that you can, with a grid, so you can do a decent job of it. Um, that's my, that is my, my goal. I will again provide you the um, the sheet of formulas. Yeah, what? Well, you're you're. I mean, that's that's what the quizzes are, though. Vector homework. Did I not post it? I think I posted it. Maybe I just posted the, did I just post the take home? I may have just said the take home quiz is the homework. Um, is, did I not actually make other homework other than that? that? That may be the case, actually. I do think if you work take home quiz seven, then you're pretty good on the vectors. I think it, it's pretty full spectrum. 
um, those eight problems. If you do those, then you're with understanding, then you're, you're pretty, pretty well understand. I would say also examples we've done in class, you know, like what have I done in class? Mostly find the angle between vectors, find lengths of vectors, add them. You know, like the only thing that's missing, I would say, from the quiz take home quiz seven is the geometric, like tip to tail edition. Uh, but we did do a lot of that in class, so I don't, don't feel too bad not giving you homework on that precise. Those, um, there are homeworks in the book on that, um, in the in the section on vectors in the book. Like if you wanted, I could tell you. Um, I was just planning on answering your questions about the uh, quizzes which have already happened and the quiz which you're currently working on and take home. So I really don't have new material. The derived one? The last take home quiz we did. Yeah, okay, we can we can look at that. So sure. So um oh, we went so um yeah, part, parts of it, I guess. But did we go for all of it? We went through half of it. Half of it. Oh, so the, how about the last? Yeah, where? Like, what was that five times? Because the five times, I think. Oh, I don't know. Did you post it? Yeah, no, yeah. Okay. No, I mean, that one is like almost an hour. Okay. It's 57 minutes. It's. Um, but to answer your question, page 744, um, you know, the problems <clears throat> number 39 through 47. I would say that's, uh, well, really the graphical problems. So basically page 744, um, I suppose those, I mean, really any of the problems on page 743 to 744 are probably helpful. Um, my only caution to you would be that the book's notation is careless because they have used, they don't distinguish between this and this. So for them, this is the vector. So they, they, they're just, so, so like me, book. <laughs> me is this, and this is length, all right? The book would probably do this. Or maybe they would do this. I, I can't remember. I'll have to look. Yeah, I think they just do, they, they call it, uh, yeah, they just, Wait, yeah. I think this is it. But the other thing to think about, um, there is some overlap between test two and test three, because I said law of sines and law of cosines, I would test again on test three, so I should ask some like law of sines and law of cosines question on test. Those would be like the last problems on second test. I'm gonna recycle those, essentially. Into this test? Yeah. yeah. Those are, pretty easy, right? I mean, if I give you, I tell you this is three, this is four, and this is 30 degrees, then I say what's C equal to? I don't think so. So here, if we think of that as A and that as B, then the law of cosines says that C squared is A squared plus B squared minus 2AB uh, cosine of the angle adjacent between A and B, or opposite C, which is 30 degrees. Okay. So C squared is equal to, in this case, 9 plus 4 minus 3 times 4 is 12 times 2 is 24. Cosine of 30 is root 3 over 2. So C is apparently plus or minus, but I think we better choose a plus. Oh, thank you. Yeah. My bad. So 25, apparently. So, you know, that would be like a law of cosines problem. Now, could you do law of sines there? I don't think it's convenient. Um, law what, was of, I, what was I doing? What was I saying? On the last test? No, like just now. Oh. Uh, oh, uh, you're thinking about area. So this is 30 degrees, 40 degrees, and then I say, you know, find, um, find A and find B, then this is, I would say, this to me feels more like a law of sines problem because but looking, looking, aside, looking aside from my notational 
hesitation about the book, there is two pages of homework there that have answers to all the odd problems. Like that's, if you exhaust my take home quiz, that's a good place to like do more. Um, Uh, but, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> I would also point out that the book does have probably, yeah, so it has, I, I don't know, I haven't looked at these, but they're probably, well, you can, it may or may not be helpful, but there's three videos linked at the end of section 8.7. They're not good? Ah, rats. That's my, um, that's my default opinion on videos. <laughs> Including my own. No, um, I think there's nothing quite like coming to class and like interacting with, being able to ask questions that you have in this thing we have called reality um, that you're paying for. But um, so um, signing, so law of signs says that um, the sine of 30 degrees over B is equal to the sine of 40 degrees over A, right? is equal to, oh no, what's this angle? It wasn't given. So I heard, one, I heard 110, right? And so it's out of 180, right? Of course, my, my picture is uh, not the greatest. But that, that's, you know, when you draw this kind of, that, that's kind of part of the, exactly, not the scale. It's, it's worse than not the scale, but yeah. Um, and that, that, that's intentional. Sign 110 degrees over three, right? So this is a number. So you can solve that for A and B. So law of signs is the right approach for that kind of problem. You know, other problems, you don't need law of signs or law of cosines, right? If I give you a right triangle and I tell you this is 30 degrees and this is two, and then I say X equals to what? Then you go, oh, well, I know, I know tangent of 30 degrees is opposite over adjacent, right? So x is 2 tangent 30. Which, by the way, is 2 sine 30 over cosine 30, which is 1 half over um, root 3 over 2, which is 2 over root 3. But you can use your calculator to calculate tangent 30 just the same, you know? But there exists this world where you're not allowed to use a calculator. Like, your math major, you will face this world. It's called, like, standard assessment tests that you face as seniors. Why? Why? I mean, like, I've grown up on the, oh, you're never going to have a calculator in your pocket. Uh-huh. But now I do. Right. So, why can't I? Um, because if we didn't allow you to have a calculator where you go, we would fail most of the students. I think. <laughs> uh, because unfortunately, there's while you have been raised in that way, and that's good, and that's part of the reason you're a stronger math student, many have not. Many have been inculcated in this culture of calculators since like second grade. That's why people are incredibly bad at algebra, because they can't add fractions, can't multiply numbers without getting a calculator. Like, if you have to pick up a calculator to multiply, you know, seven times eight. Well, hold on, seven times eight, the sevens and eights. Sevens and eights are, but my, my, my point to you is that's like, I mean, yeah, you can do it with a calculator, right? But the person who doesn't need to pick up a calculator is so far beyond you in terms of like their progress on the problem. It's just like in here, you have to pick up a calculator to, to pl plug in zero into cosine to find out it's one, you've just wasted 10 seconds, you know? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the more you know, and, and ultimately, uh, I mean, I don't know. But anyway, it, it's, you know, it, it's kind of like the question of like, um, it's, I, I often give the analogy, it's, it's like, uh, you know, people, people are training for a marathon and they're like, yeah, I, I'm really low on cash. I've had to call so many Ubers this week to train. You know, it doesn't make sense, right? Like, the, yeah. you, you have to run. <laughs> and so if you're, you know, if you're always getting a calculator out and, um, ah, uh, yeah. I 
I mean, on the flip side of things, yes, ultimately, if you're going to practice mathematics for an industry, for a job or something, you do need to learn how to interface your calculations with, with computers. And that's not this either. So this is also a bad hat. Well, I mean, it's OK for checking things, but you can't. I mean, you don't want to give a report to your boss that's like, I took these numbers, I hand punched them into my calculator, and I found blah. You know, it's much better to be able to like see attached Excel sheet for the calculations. So that when you've made a mistake that's systematic through hundreds and hundreds of operations, it can be systematically corrected and you don't have to redo all the, you know. Um, okay, so uh, let me work. Uh, one of the problems from the quiz, which I did not work in class, since you say you, um, you'd like to see more, and I'd like to show you more, sure. So here's one, and I don't, they're supposed to derive, and this is kind of, um, so I've talked a lot in class about, you know, finding roots and, you know, doing arithmetic operations on, pol on complex numbers using, like, the polar representation and all that. And I've done some of these derivation problems, but to me this is actually kind of the more fun thing for trigonometry is that you can calculate trigonometric identities using the imaginary exponentials. So you're supposed to derive this is equal to something. I won't even write it down because we don't actually have to write it down if we understand the imaginary exponential method, which is just to take your cosines and your sines and convert them to imaginary exponentials. So this is one half e to the 2ix plus e to the minus 2ix, 1 over 2i, e to the 3ix minus e to the minus 3ix. Right, so <clears throat> there are two fundamental identities. The one is that cosine theta is 1 half e to the theta plus e to the i theta. Yeah. Well, these are, I mean, this is what's new, is that we can write these in terms of these imaginary exponentials. So these, these two formulas here, they're a close cousin to Euler's formula, which is crucial to most of what we're doing in the complex stuff, which is the e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. Remember, this is behind writing z is equal to the magnitude of z cosine theta plus the magnet uh, plus i times the magnitude of z sine theta the fact that so this is like the radius and x is equal to r cosine theta y is equal to r sine theta well r is equal to really r is equal to the magnitude of z you know and so we can factor the magnitude of z out that is true um, the magnitude of z is equal to the square root of z, z bar. That is true. You're also right about that. Um, so this is, yeah, I mean, but um, so what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, this is fundamental to our discussion is that we can take and use the imaginary exponential to write the complex number in polar form in like that natural um, algebraic way, if you will. And on the other hand, if you solve, if you, if you like write, what I did was I wrote e to the i theta, and then I wrote e to the minus, the, mean e to the minus i theta. I added the equations. When you add the equations, the sines cancel out. You get a cosine formula. When you subtract the equations, the cosines cancel out, and you get a sine formula. So, um, so what I'm trying to say is both of these formulas come from this and just like a little bit of algebra. The thing is, once you know these formulas, you can take sine and cosine and convert them to imaginary exponentials. And the reason that's interesting is because then you can just do algebra. So how do you, this is just e to the 5ix, because 2 plus 3 is 5. And this times this is minus e to the minus 5ix, because minus 2 minus 3 is minus 5. And then, um, then I have, well, I'll do this one here, plus e to the ix, and then minus e to the minus ix. That's just laws of algebra. Now, I proved that formula for the imaginary exponential. It required use of the adding angles formula for sine and cosine, both of them. 
the, the wisdom of the, both adding angles formulas is, is in using that algebra that I just did. And so this is like 1 half 1 over 2i e to the 5ix minus e to the minus 5ix. And the reason I'm writing it this way is to make an identification again. See, I, my, my bridge between imaginary exponentials and sines and cosines are these two formulas. So I have to see those formulas appearing to get back. I'm starting with something real. I end with something real. That's, that's, a, that's a given. So yeah, there's imaginary stuff in the in-between, but at the end of the day, we have a real expression. So I know I can get back. And I also know that because I've got one over two i's, there's got to be a sign. Because the only way to get rid of those is to put in signs. Um, right, from that formula. And so that formula with theta equals to 5x, or that formula with theta equal to x. Now we're done. So this gives us 1 half sine 5x plus 1 half sine of x. And that is the trigonometric identity I asked you to derive. So did you cancel out the i? Where's the i? I, I, I is, is part of the sine. Oh, so your, take, so your sine takes out the mm -hmm. 1 half or 1 yeah. over 2i right. the e i for both, right? That's right. We have to recognize. So you're limiting this by what that 5 is. Yeah, we have to recognize that pattern and absorb it in there. I mean, Another way to look at it is this e to the i theta. It's complex, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so is the 1 over i. Mm -hmm. And it just turns out that the product of this and that gives us something that's real. They're both actually pure imaginary. Um, oh, my bad. Look at this. That's not right. I'm supposed to have a, let me get away with that. That's supposed to be a minus. Otherwise, yeah. But I, point out, let me. I mean, again, emphasize what just happened here. We didn't have to remember that trig identity, right? We just derived it. We started with this. We did algebra steps, and we found that. Okay. Now, granted, that's like formula number 37 on our sheet or whatever, but suppose you don't have the sheet. Well, this gives you like a clear path of how to derive a ton of things. Yeah. So. Yeah, the first time I ever heard about it was from my modern physics professor. Dr. Reynolds, who said he was forbidden in the physics department to discuss this in our modern physics class. So, of course, at that point, I became obsessed with why, why, why can't he tell us this? <laughs> why couldn't he? Because they were afraid it was too sophisticated for the students, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think it's that complicated once you just see about three examples and understand what's going on. It's not that. It's something that could be taught in high school. It's not calculus, it's not, right. I mean, there are other things we've done in here which are far more sophisticated, like finding all the solutions of, like the ones where we have to find six solutions for a sine function because it has many cycles and it cuts through the lines multiple points. To me, that's far more complicated than this. But. Right. Indeed. <coughs> but, you know, again, if you start with something real, you have to end with something real. So it's like you're not, yeah. not without a path. But anyway, again, I'll try to make the quiz Wednesday about graphing polars because I think there's, we need to talk more about that.